we're going to talk about the management of septic shock in pregnancy. And of course, that also means we talk about sepsis and infection as well. And doc, this afternoon, Dr. Zanotti is going to talk about other critical care issues uh, in the pregnant woman. So let's start with some statistics. Maternal sepsis is the third most common cause of death in pregnant women across the world. It's interesting that the incidence of maternal sepsis appears to be increasing in developed countries. So it's increasing in those of, with high income uh, societies. The reasons are not complete, cl completely clear. But we also have to recognize that the impact of maternal sepsis is just not only on the mother, but also on the fetus, because there's an increased incidence of neonatal sepsis, perinatal mortality, as well as premature birth. The mortality rate from maternal sepsis varies widely by country. What you'll see in the literature is 4 to 14 percent, but it's been described as high as 50 percent in some reports. The greatest uh, mortality, the highest rate of mortality, actually is in sepsis that occurs before delivery. And about 50% of sepsis actually occurs before delivery. When you look at studies that try to figure out what the risk factors are for death in maternal sepsis, you'll find three common themes. <clears throat> delay in diagnosis, delay in administration of antibiotics, and also a delay in escalating the care of that particular woman. So I think it's important to keep these themes in mind as we approach the management of septic shock. So uh, there's three main components, I would say, of managing the patient in septic shock who is pregnant. Early recognition, resuscitation, and maintaining perfusion. But here we have not only the mother, the patient, but we also have a fetus that we have to consider. And then the third component is controlling the source of infection. So these components are really the same that you use when you approach a non-pregnant patient with sepsis. <clears throat> so here's a case, an obese woman, 29 years old, her first pregnancy, she's 37 weeks of gestation. She has onset of labor and she has premature rupture of her amniotic membranes. <clears throat> After 24 hours of labor, the decision is made to start oxytocin. Her heart rate's 105, her blood pressure's 90 over 50, her respiratory rate's 24, temperature's 38.1, and she has a good oxygen saturation. But she's complaining of diffuse abdominal pain. So the question is, does this patient have sepsis? How many say yes? Okay. I think it's a little biased since it's a presentation on sepsis, right? Well, the reality is <clears throat> this really brings us to the point of trying to decide what is the definition of sepsis in a pregnant woman. So just as a review, we have the sepsis three definitions that have been proposed, but this was not developed for pregnant women. But the, the definition is that it's life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by a dysregulated immune response of the host to an infection. Now that's a pathophysiologic definition, but as far as applying it at the bedside, what has been proposed is the use of the SOFA score to identify organ dysfunction, and that you have to have at least a change in the SOFA score of at least two or more. And those changes have to be due to infection. They've also proposed the quick SOFA, which is used as a screening tool. Again, this did not include aspects of pregnancy when this, these, this, these uh, definitions were developed. The septic shock definition, which was proposed, is a little interesting because it's saying it's a condition associated with sepsis where the circulatory metabolic cellular abnormalities are so profound that it increases mortality. We usually don't define disease by mortality. So this is not a pathophysiologic definition. It's a mortality kind of definition. And here the clinical criteria were hypotension, 
that required vasopressors to maintain a mean arterial pressure of at least 65 millimeter mercury, and they had to have a lactate greater than two after resuscitation with volume. So unfortunately, this definition emphasizes refractory shock, not early shock. This is refractory shock. So the World Health Organization has undertaken a project to try to define sepsis in pregnancy. So they issued a declaration uh, two years ago, and the definition they modeled after sepsis 3, which I'm not sure is maybe in the best uh, interest of the patients, they defined it as a condition that's life-threatening, characterized by organ dysfunction resulting from infection during pregnancy, during delivery, postpartum, and also post-abortion. Now, they have not definitively defined clinical criteria to apply that definition, but the good thing I think they're saying is that they're going to look for simple and practical criteria for identification of sepsis in pregnant women and also for confirmation of sepsis. Their consultants, their experts, said that perhaps criteria for identification should be based on the suspicion or confirmation of infection and then signs of organ dysfunction, and they used the words mild to moderate. Okay, so that's good, except that, remember, organ dysfunction is already a late finding. But the criteria they came up with or they're suggesting, if you'll look at them, are a combination of SIRS criteria <clears throat> and a little bit of organ dysfunction. So tachycardia comes from SIRS. Tachypnea comes from SIRS. Hypotension comes from sepsis 3. And then organ dysfunction, altered mental status, and low urine output are similar to some of the sepsis 3. So they're using a combination, but this isn't the criteria that have been finalized at this time. So basically, sepsis 3 definitions have not been validated for obstetric patients, so probably not best to use them. Both sepsis 3 and even the World Health Organization definition <clears throat> tend to emphasize later stages of infection. Whereas clinically, what you want to do is identify early and start treatment before organ dysfunction develops. The major difficulty uh, and limitation of using organ dysfunction in pregnancy is that the physiologic changes usually result in either <clears throat> low or high overestimation of sepsis when you use organ dysfunction in pregnancy. There are some scores that people have uh, proposed. First of all, SIRS and the quick SOFA have been shown to overestimate morbidity and mortality in obstetric patients, so they're not great. There's a sepsis uh, obstetric score that's been, that's been proposed using vital signs, oxygenation, white blood cell count, and lactate, and that's specific for sepsis. And then there are some tools that are not specific for sepsis, but have been used in obstetrics. And one is the, the maternal early warning tool, and also the maternal obstetric, or the modified obstetric early warning scale. The value of these tools is probably more for negative predictive value. So if the patient score is low or zero, depending on which tool, you can feel fairly confident that the patient does not have sepsis. <clears throat> but they are not useful for ruling in sepsis in this patient population. But I think what you do when you go to the bedside is you look at that patient and you look at what are the risk factors for this patient to have sepsis. And that includes the personal characteristics of the patient as well as some of the, as well as some of the obstetric factors that increase risk. And then you look at clinical signs and symptoms. So looking at not only the mother, but here the fetus as well. So let's go through some of these factors. So risk factors. <clears throat> these are personal characteristics. Advanced age, but 
keep in mind, advanced age in obstetrics is 35. I always hate saying that. Obesity, um, a, a immune compromise, diabetes, heart, liver failure, chronic comorbidities, um, sickle cell disease, low socioeconomic level. All of these are things that you see in non-pregnant patients. Anemia, malnutrition. Some unique things, though, for uh, women that are pregnant is if they are carriers of group B strep or if there is group A strep in some of their contacts. So those are kind of unique risk factors. Smoking, prior infection, of course, would also increase risk. <clears throat> now, the obstetric risk, risk factors are unique to pregnancy. By far, the most important risk factor for sepsis in obstetrics is del cesarean delivery. You can almost guarantee that you'll find that at the top of every list. But any other invasive procedure, first child, our case was a first child, multiple gestation, rupture of membranes, prolonged labor, multiple vaginal exams. So the more vaginal exams, the higher the risk of sepsis. Retain products of conception. Hemorrhage either, uh, particularly postpartum hemorrhage and or the need for transfusion. Increased risk of infection. Vaginal trauma, not surprising. And then if there is a cesarean section or some operative interventions, if you have a hematoma of the wound, it increases risk. Now, when we look at clinical manifestations, there's some general ones. These are the same that you use for a non-pregnant patient. Fever. In a pregnant woman, fever always warrants an investigation for infection. However, patients with sepsis may not have a fever. Tachycardia. In pregnancy, it's a little difficult. If the woman's in labor and in pain, the heart rate goes up. Arterial pressure that's lower than expected, and here the key word is expected because of the lower blood pressures in pregnancy. Increase in respiratory rate. However, respiratory rate goes up when women are having contractions, so it's not as specific. There's still reasonable clinical signs to look for. Unique things to obstetrics as far as looking for manifestation is uterine sensitivity or irritability abdominal or pelvic pain, um, a purulent or um, odorous uh, vaginal discharge, persistent vaginal bleeding after delivery. Toxic shock, you would be looking for an maculopapular red uh, rash in your patient. And then the other infection to think about is mastitis, so you're looking for erythema and sensitivity or pain uh, in the breast. Now, coming back to the kind of the non-obstetric manifestation, we've already mentioned the vital sign abnormalities, but remember that pregnant women also have pneumonias. They can get urinary tract infections. They can get appendicitis. So looking for things such as sputum production, cough. They may have flank pain, dysuria. And they also may have abdominal pain suggesting appendicitis rather than a, an obstetric cause. Don't forget, we have to look at the fetus as well for clinical manifestation, and the most common parameter that you're gonna use here is the fetal heart rate. So a fetal heart rate greater than 170 should always prompt you to consider the diagnosis of sepsis in the mother. So very important to monitor the fetus when you're, and assess the fetus as part of your evaluation. <clears throat> so let's, kind of go forward, if we've identified our patient, how are we going to treat them? Well, it's very, it's very similar to your other patients. We're going to give resuscitation, maintain perfusion, and we do that with intravenous fluids and vasopressors. But the unique thing about pregnancy is that you have to make sure that the uterus is displaced from the inferior vena cava. In fact, you really shouldn't call a patient as hypotensive until you have relieved that potential obstruction on the inferior vena cava. So they must be in the left lateral pos decubitus position. And then control of infection, same thing here, antibiotics and sometimes surgical intervention or drainage techniques. Well, you just heard Dr. Tapool talk about the uh, Surviving Sepsis Campaign Guidelines. 
But keep in mind that these guidelines were not developed for obstetric patients. They've not been validated in obstetric patients. And you have to take into account those physiologic changes of pregnancy and the special characteristics of a pregnant woman when you're trying to interpret the guidelines and use them in these patients. So when we talk about intravenous fluids, here you need to assess arterial pressure, heart rate, and organ perfusion, and that includes the use of lactate. You also have to evaluate those fetal heart rate as well, so not just the mother, but the fetus as well. The recommendation is still to use crystalloid fluids initially for resuscitation. And as you know, the criteria for resuscitation with the surviving sepsis campaign is hypotension or a lactate greater than four. It's not clear that those criteria fit with the pregnant woman. So you'll have to decide whether it's important in your patient, but going back to their clinical presentation is probably more important. Surviving sepsis campaign says that you should use initially 30 mLs per kilo in the first three hours. Well, that's a potential problem uh, in pregnancy because, as you know, pregnant women exist in a state of volume overload. In addition, their colloid osmotic pressure is decreased, so they are at greater risk of developing pulmonary edema. Many obstetrical experts actually recommend starting with 20 mLs per kilogram of intravenous fluids for resuscitation. And also, the other thing you can do in pregnancy is use monitoring tools and measurement tools to assess response to the, the fluid resuscitation, and we'll talk a little bit more about <coughs> options that you might have for that. Well, the Surviving Sepsis Campaign says you should aim for a mean arterial pressure of 65, but there's no data uh, to guide that recommendation in obstetric patients, and as you know, <clears throat> a mean arterial pressure less than 65 may be absolutely normal for a pregnant woman. So it, that goal of 65 is probably going to be too high for the majority of your patients. So it may be better to use clinical goals to assess your adequacy of perfusion with your resuscitation rather than a specific number for the blood pressure. So back to monitoring. You should measure the lactate. I'll give you a little bit more information about lactate in pregnancy. And the measurements of preload, such as the central venous pressure, really are not helpful, particularly when pregnant women are volume overloaded. There's also no proof of any superiority of the other less invasive types of monitoring tools, such as bioreactants or some of the minimally invasive, FlowTrack, PICO, LIDCO. Just as in our regular patients, <clears throat> they've all been used. They've been used and described in pregnancy, but we have no idea if any is better or more reliable than any other method. Now, it's interesting, there's not much data about lactate in pregnancy, so I'll give you what we do know. Interestingly, it doesn't just come from the mother. It also comes from the fetus and the placenta. So that's very different than the non-pregnant patient. So it comes from more sources. What we do know from a few studies is that the lactate level is normal between 6 to 18 weeks and between 36 to 42 weeks of gestation. However, during labor, particularly the second stage of labor, the lactate may go up very high, greater than 5, and that's not necessarily associated with any sepsis or infection. It's thought that the lactate is generated by anaerobic fetal metabolism. So you have to be careful about interpreting a lactate during labor. What is clear from studies is that the higher the lactate level, even if it's in the normal range, it's if it's at the high end of the normal range, it's associated with more adverse outcomes in the pregnant woman. One study looked at the um, characteristics of a lactate greater than or equal to four and found that it was 88% specific for severe sepsis, but not very sensitive. That's probably true for many of our patients. When we were talking about monitoring tools, a lot of the monitoring tools, minimally invasive tools, uh, use or can use passive leg raising. And the question comes up, can you use that in a pregnant woman? 
What we do know is that in severe preeclampsia, passive leg raising does predict response to fluids. There's a similar response at 22 to 24 weeks in a pregnant woman compared to a non-pregnant woman. But what we don't know is how accurate passive leg raising is in the last trimester because that's when you're more likely to have uterine compression of the venous return. So if you're going to use passive leg raising, the recommendation is that the woman has to be in the left lateral decubitus. You have to displace the uterus before doing a passive leg raise. But it has been used successfully. It's a nice way to do a fluid responsiveness test without giving more fluid. Vasopressors. Well, in pregnancy, um, there is no autoregulation of blood flow to the uterus and fetus. So blood flow is dependent on the mother's blood pressure, which means hypotension in the mother decreases perfusion to the fetus. So what are you going to do if you fluids don't work? Well, vasopressors are an option. Noradrenaline is the first recommended um, vasopressor. But do not use vasopressin because there is a possibility of inducing contraction. So that is not used in pregnancy. So that's different than a non-pregnant woman. Here you also have to aim for a lower goal on your mean arterial pressure, as we previously discussed. And it is appropriate to consider steroids in patients who are refractory to fluids and pressors, just as you would in any other patient. Studies have mainly been done in animals, uh, but all the vasopressors, dopamine, adrenaline, noradrenaline, and phenylephrine decrease blood flow to the uterus. So keep that in mind. Use your vasopressors really as a last resort. And even when you bring the blood pressure up with a vasopressor, it does not necessarily restore flow to the, to the uterus. So we may be getting a better number, but the fetus is still going to be in trouble. Antibiotics. You're going to use antibiotics just as you do in a non-pregnant patient. You're going to get cultures before antibiotics. You're going to give antibiotics as fast as you can, hopefully within one hour. But the difference in pregnancy is you must adjust the doses for the increase in glomerular filtration rate and the increased volume of distribution. So here you may need help from a pharmacist in dosing. Ideally, the recommendations are to try to use drugs where you can monitor levels. Unfortunately, that's not always going to be possible. But when you can, using vancomycin, you can monitor levels. Just remember, you're going to need higher doses for most of your antibiotics in pregnant women. You're going to use broad-spectrum antibiotics. Again, the majority of sepsis is due to genital urinary sources, so it's polymicrobial. You need to cover gram positives, gram negatives, anaerobes, and aerobes. If you do have good culture results, then you can narrow the spectrum when you have those results. There's a few antibiotics we try to avoid, and you know those fluoroquinolones and also the aminoglycosides. Uh, the aminoglycosides are not only ototoxic for mother, but they're ototoxic for the fetus. So we try, if at all possible, to avoid those. But in many cases, it may be life-saving in some patients. Other uh, options for controlling the source of sepsis in, in uh, pregnant women is if you have a uterine infection, basically you need to deliver the fetus. Inevitably, these women will go into labor. So allow labor to continue. And if labor is not, can, is not progressing, then the fetus needs to be removed. If you have a non-uterine infection, then if there's an abscess, you drain it. If there's an infected catheter, you take it out, just as you would in anyone else. And then in postpartum sepsis, always consider the possibility of retained products of conception. So that's very common and needs to be addressed in your patients. So the last thing I want to mention is prophylaxis. Now, I, I realize this isn't part of treating the patient in septic shock, but I think we have to do our best 
to prevent septic shock in pregnancy. So these recommendations come from the World Health Organization. And the first is probably the most important is for cesarean section, is to give antibiotics before in the skin incision. Some people were recommending always to do it after clamping of the umbilical cord, but the studies suggest you have better decrease in infection if you give the antibiotic before cutting the skin. Third or fourth degree perineal tears, manual extraction of the placenta, and then also premature rupture of the membranes are all conditions where you need to give prophylactic antibiotics. So I'll leave you with those thoughts, and thank you very much. Gracias.